Hello and welcome to Just Ask, our live monthly session on the EAO YouTube channel. My name is Hayley Edmonds and I'm delighted to be with you for yet another interactive appointment here on the internet, an opportunity that brings professionals together from around the world for a live chat with a leading expert in implant dentistry and today is no exception. My, now, before we get this session underway, where are you tuning in from? This is, as you know, a global live session. So tell us what you are, who you are, <laughs> what you do, and of course, where you are tuning in from. Uh, we have Turka, who is tuning in from Istanbul. Victor, who is joining us from Davos. Thank you so much. Already you can see how international this is. So as I say, drop where you are joining us from in the live chat. Now, as I said earlier, this is an opportunity for you to speak to some of the industry's professionals. So why not ask your questions throughout the session in the live chat and we'll do our best to, best to answer them. So who is connected once again? Hello from Weisbaden, Germany. Uh, Jessica is joining us from Spain. So today's guest is no exception to the international uh, side of this EAO uh, Just Ask session. She's joining us from Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, how are you doing, Dr. Mirella Ferrari? Hi, Hayley. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so Very much. Nice to see you. <laughs> you too. Thank you so Thank much you for, for having us. <laughs> No, it's so great. It's so fantastic to have you here with us today. Now, of course, the subject of today's session is restorative tissue interface in an aesthetic zone, a topic that Dr. Ferraro is extremely experienced in not only practicing, but also lecturing on and writing about with an in-depth knowledge and experience in the fields of perioprosthetics and aesthetic dentistry. Dr. Morella focuses on restorative and state-of-the-art perioplastic surgical treatments, which she shares in her global lectures and, of course, workshops, articles, but also your books. Uh, you're an expert in high quality dental photographic documentation, and you've authored bestseller book, Dental Visualization, published by Quintessence Publishing. So, well, I mean, there's so many, so many strings to your bow already. Uh, we can't wait to hear what you have for us this evening. Um, now, just to kind of get this underway, uh, maybe you could just uh, give the brief introduction as to what is an aesthetic restoration, uh, what criteria you should be looking for, and maybe what interface can create a harmonious, beautiful result. Well, Haley, you know, this topic, um, actually, it's um, a very difficult one because, um, first of all, when you talk about the aesthetic zone, uh, it's like uh, the most challenging aspect in any restorative dentistry. It doesn't matter uh, which field, restorative, uh, you know, implantology and so on. So whatever we do clinically, we know that it's going to be visible and it has to integrate from a patient perspective like a natural tooth. So when we describe this interface is actually what do we expect? We expect in order to have a harmonious smile, uh, we expect a natural response from something that is natural, which are the soft tissues, and something that is artificial, which can be a veneer, it can be a crown, it can be even a pontic after a tooth extraction. But what we need to understand is that whatever we perform, and especially when we are dealing with soft tissue surgery, with mucogingival surgery, it has to integrate as natural as the adjacent dentition. So pink is not enough. So when we talk about soft tissue augmentation, it's not enough just to say, okay, I'm going to perform a soft tissue augmentation or connective tissue bra, because that area has to look as natural as possible as the area that has not been treated. And I gave this a quick example because, for example, even if you are able to create beautiful ceramic restoration with an extraordinarily talented, like in this case, Stefano, uh, at the end of the day, it's the pink in relationship with the white. So for this, we had to treat this recession, but the, the point is that when you look at it, at the, this type of response and this type of integration, you understand, well, this is harmonious because it looks natural. It looks like the, the teeth are surrounding. There is a nice envelope, a natural envelope, and it looks natural because also the color 
the texture, but as well as the architecture, the scalloping of the tissue is similar with the teeth that haven't been treated. So if I can just move along and take you through the topic that, you know, when they, we say cervical contouring concept, or that's what we like to call a model-based cervical design, and this will bring me a little bit to the implant world, but it's important to understand that the concept is there also natural dentition, it follows us also when we are extracting teeth in the aesthetic zone, not always we are placing an implant. And by the way, our patients don't necessarily ask for an implant. What they ask, Haley, and you, you know it very well, it's just to have a tooth, a natural restoration. So, and also of course in the, in the implant area. So when we look at just this very simple example, uh, for example, closing spaces, which in restorative dentistry is a very common clinical situation. We understand so well the impact of how the ceramic restoration will have an effect, the design of the ceramic restoration will have an effect on where the position of the soft tissue will be. So when you're closing spaces, what you want to obtain at the end is to transform, let's say, the position of the tissues, which are flat, in a more scalloped. And for that, just briefly, the preparation or where would you like to position the margins of the restoration are very important in the final result. So they have to be intracircular, give support for the tissue in order to obtain this type of natural scalloping uh, that we would like to have and what we have around natural teeth, for example, like this. So again, just by Simple example, closing spaces, recontouring or reshaping the tissues with the help of the ceramic restoration is dependent on how those restorations are being defined. Then if you have a situation that you have to remove a tooth, and as I mentioned, not always the solution is um, an implant restoration. This was a case I treated uh, you saw like five, six years ago, then she had to, uh, we had, she had an accident, we had to remove, uh, to extract the tooth number 11, and the proposed option for her and the acceptable one was to go for uh, a traditional bridge. But even in this situation, if you expect to have a, a nice looking, a harmonious result, that tooth that is missing, that pontic area, has to look like a tooth emerging from the soft tissue. For that, we need to take care of the surroundings, meaning at the time of extraction, we already take care of the hard tissues, the soft tissues, like doing this type of soft tissue grafting. And later on, we can go more in depth regarding that. Having a provisional restoration at the immediate after the extraction, just to give support. And then we start to condition the tissues with our restorations. But in order to have, um, something to play with, if we can call it like that, we need to have the volume of tissues. And in pontic sites, this is the concept that we predominantly use today, so-called the banana uh, concept. And again, what does it mean? It means that the design of the pontic area will be in accordance to where we would like the tissues to be positioned. So we will always have a flat area, then we will have an area that is pushing the tissue that, that we like to call a pressure zone. And then you have a zone that gives support. And we will see there is a lot of familiarity also when you design the uh, restoration or implant following the same concept. So clinically, how does it look? You have the area that is pushing the tissue and you have the cervical area that is giving support for the tissues so that at the end, the scalloping, the profile and the, uh, the emergence profile of that restoration will be very similar to the adjacent tooth. Okay, so then we copy that into the definitive. And this is very similar also from the implant world. Um, and this is how the definitive restoration, very clearly, this is the area that gives support, which is, has to be similar to the one of the natural tooth, the adjacent central incisor, like we see in the left side of the image. And then you have the area that is going to condition the tissue and position it where we would like to have it. And then you have a nice integration of this. So, Basically, we need to understand two main aspects. One is it, the soft tissues and the restorations are interrelated, meaning that you can have one without the other if you want to aim for something that is really harmonious and very similar to the natural. The idea is that once you have sufficient amount of tissues, then you can have a correctly designed restoration. And again, it can be a pontic or it can be an implant. It doesn't matter. 
if you're missing soft tissues, and we will see later on, you will have always a deficiency and never that restoration will look like a tooth emerging from the soft tissue area. And this kind of brings me to the um, implant world and why, because, and I like to, to share with you this type of, uh, this is one of the longest follow-ups that we had together with Nitsan. Um, this is a case that he treated almost 30 years ago. So you imagine that at that time where the information and the, the understanding of the soft tissue and the, how the bone is responding and how the restoration should be was much more limited than today. And the uh, concepts have changed also in the implant world and still look after 32 years, there is a very stable result with a slight discrepancy, you know, mig migration from the soft tissue margin position which was at that time very much acceptable. This was really, and it is really an outstanding result. But what has changed today, the expectations. Expectations have changed also from us as a clinician, from ourselves to ourselves and our collaborators, but also from the patient perspective, okay? So today we know so much about uh, the fact that also integration is not anymore that of an issue, the problem is when you start to deal with the prosthetics, especially in the aesthetic zone. So technically we can say that we actually raise the bar in terms of what should we can expect to have in a final result, even with implants in the aesthetic zone, single implants, adjacent implants. So the demand of a harmonious and close to ideal result have increased. Okay. So when we look at this entire complex, um, you can separate it into, let's say, the envelope, which is the hard tissues and the soft tissues. You have then the abutment that is emerging. And here also we have uh, different approaches uh, today. And then you have the final restorations. So we can divide them and discuss about them separately, but actually they are so much interdependent. And in the concept of this um, interface, we always start from the prerequisite that the implants are correctly positioned in the bony envelope. And then what I would try just to give like a small insight is how can we in a predictable way manage the tissues with our restoration? So we start from the, let's say default is that the implants are correctly positioned from a three-dimensional uh, aspect. And now we have to understand how much tissues do we need and how do we contour that restoration so that the end, the final result will look harmonious. And this is a very typical example when you discuss about the expectations of the patient. They don't really care if you have, if they have an implant, they have two implants. What they want at the end is to be able to smile and what makes them, let's say, uh, feel good about the final result if they have the pink surrounding the white. So from aesthetic perspective, the aesthetics on those restorations are depending, the bottom line is that they are depending on the volume of the soft tissues that we are able to create or to generate around those implants. And then in relationship to that, having a restoration that is properly contoured. And now you can also ask me, Haley, for example, okay, but you talk about volume of tissues, how, how much tissues do we need? And I'm, here, I'm presuming that it's like, you know, the, the, I can see, you know, it's either having the virtual, the um, vertical, but also the horizontal. Um, exactly. It's both exactly. because it's all very well both. having in one, uh, one angle, if you will, one part. But what about, you know, it's having every, everything being kind it's, of exactly it's like to play Three with. Three dimensional, exactly. And again, you know, when we look at the literature and there are many studies have been done, okay, what is the, let's say the minimum, mm. minimum thickness of tissues that you should have so that your final restoration will have a nice contour, an acceptable contour. And the relationship is that between the bone and the soft tissue overall, you need to have at least three millimeters. And I say three millimeters because these three millimeters can be, uh, differentiate or separate it into, you can have one millimeter of bone and you can have two millimeters of soft tissues. The idea is that overall, you need to have at least three millimeters 
of, of tissues buccally to the implant. And then because I mentioned uh, at the beginning, there is always going to be a soft tissue approach. We understand now today so much because if we don't have a soft tissue approach, we will always have some kind of deficiency or let's say some kind of lack of volume. And at the end, the final aesthetic result depends on the pink in the majority of the situation. So our approach can be different in terms of what type of soft tissue graft we are going to do regarding the timing. It can be either of the time of implant placement, and then we can have different approaches regarding if this is going to be a one stage or a two stage approach, or it can be at the time of uncovering of those implants and there it depends on the defect that we have that we are going to choose the technique. But in the majority of the cases, we prefer to go for a connective tissue graft as, as, as overall. But I'm assuming you also have to have a very clear idea of the biology um, around the implant as well and understand the biological parameters um, equally um, of the gingival tissue that you'll be working with. Definitely, you know, the, one of the advantages with, with, with implants compared to natural dentition is that we have a mucosa. So this mucosa, as long as you develop it considerably, you have advantage because it, it, um, it, you can guide it. It mm. will react to the pressure or lack of pressure that you apply on it with your restoration. You know, with, with natural dentition, we are very much limited because of biology. So with around the implants, it's because this is, a, um, as a, let's say, um, completely different, um, um, I would say, uh, type of fibers that we have. So we generally like to call them that it's a mucosa the, the um, response in relationship with the crown will be different. So we have a lot, much bigger play, uh, playground, if you like to call that. But also the soft tissues, when we graft, and we usually today go for, as a donor side, the palate. This mm -hmm. is like still the gold standard, is like, like, like to call it, um, that works the best. But even from the same palate, you can have different type of grafts. And this is also important to understand because not all of them will behave the same. And we know this from, uh, for example, from teeth, if you take a graft from a tuberosity, and these are actually the three different types, main groups of, of type of grafts that you can have, like a free gingival graft, a tuberosity graft, and a subepithelial connective tissue graft, um, they behave different clinically because they have a different composition. So for example, tuberosity grafts are very known to have a hyperplastic response. They grow, okay? So you might end up with much more tissue that you will need. And this can be a problem in the aesthetic zone. So I'm imagining if you're kind of, you're covering up a root, it'll be completely different to covering up an Im a visible implant. For completely example. different, exactly. Yeah. Completely different type of, of graft. And it also pontics, you know, the decision will be completely different, why? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, just grafting or having pink tissue is not enough. This pink tissue shouldn't be with extra volume, so it shouldn't grow over time. It should integrate with the surface. It should have the same color and texture as the natural dentition. So you think you're taking graft from an area where that is the palate. It has a different color, a different composition, and you bring it in a zone that is highly aesthetic and visible. So here the decision will be different. For example, tuberosity grafts, we know today that we try to limit their use for root coverage, for example, because of this hyperplastic response. And we they work very good, for example, in pontic sites. Uh, with implants, it's the same. It depends also on what would you like to achieve from the procedure. What is the, let's say, the mucogingival goal? That's the, also something that is, uh, for example, if I show you, you see here very clearly, this is a, a free gingival graft that is, you just remove the epithelium extra orally. And this is subepithelial connective tissue graft. So they come from the palate. They might come from the same area, but just because of the different techniques, they will have a different composition. So you see one is more whitish. They are very, it's very dense, very good quality of connective tissue, but they will have different clinical applicability. Absolutely. For example, 
you cannot leave exposed such a free gene of a graph deepitalized for a root coverage, for example, because it will not survive exposed. On the other hand, it is very useful in all the situation where we try to mask, like we are going to see maybe later on, darkness of uh, abutments or the, um, you know, on the buccal aspect of the implants, because it's a very good quality of connective tissue. It is very stable and it's maturing with growth over time. Is, is that not because it has a, this is the, carat the keratin um, the, the, that enhances no, that? It's not, it is, no, it depends. It is just because of the anatomy of the palate. Okay. The more deeper you go in the palate, you go to the layers of that you have more glandular and fatty tissue. For example, I don't know if you see my screen, but if you take one graft, free gingival graft, and you start from the molar with the back of the palate to the anterior zone, you see that it will have a different composition just because of the anatomy. So if your aim is to go for a high quality, like Professor Zucchelli has emphasized so much that the importance is the quality of the tissue. Hmm. And you want to have dense connective tissue. So you see, you have to go way back from the palate. The more you move to the anterior area, you will have a fatty glandular tissue, which is much less stable, let's say, in time. It, it has a, a higher um, predisposition to resorb over time. So it has a nice volume at the time that you take it. It looks great in pictures. But uh, clinical wise, it is less stable, and the maturation is is uh, less, uh, let's say, impressive like it is with uh, this type of very dense connective tissue. They have this tendency to to slightly grow, which is what we would like to have. Mirella, we have a question from Alfonso sure. Gill, who wants to know: In what clinical scenarios do you decide to use soft substitutes around implants? As you are, uh, I, I thought I just maybe be more specific. Graphing. Sorry. In what situation around implants, I decide to use soft tissue grafting? So soft, uh, soft substitutes around implants, right? I, I always go for uh, the palate. Um, I, the problem is with all the substitutes is their stability in time. You know, when yeah. you, there are different um, materials on the market. Some of them, for example, they look great when you see them on the table, you wet them. But then you have to think if there's going to be a flap on top of that craft, of that substitute, usually it, it reduces their volume. So it's less stable. So the result, you might say that you will not have a, a big increase, but you might also not have a loss, but it's not predictable. So I don't have a lot of experience with substitutes. I always go for, um, in general, my preferred approach is go for a free gingival graft, the epitalized the Zucchelli technique, because yeah. I see, um, first of all, that they are stable. And second of all, with, in time, I see an improvement in terms of the, of the thickness of the tissues. So this is why I don't have a lot of, um, let's say, experience with substitutes and still the, I, the, it works so well from the, let's say, the patient providing it. So I, I don't see a reason. Uh, I never had a problem with patient not accepting this, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you go for free gingival grafts because the morbidity for the patient is much less. Okay, so the pain after the procedure is considerably less than what we were used to with um, the, the single incision technique. But I imagine That's if you true. say that the client's expectations are so much higher now that they'd probably, you know, I, I imagine it's easier to convince them that the result will be better what? if you do, you know, if you do follow your approach. We explain, usually we explain to them, of course, that, the, and also it, it becomes an integral part of the procedure. It is we rarely explain, explain, um, give it to the patient as an option. You know, it has to be something really um, exceptional. So the patient will say, I will not, I'm, I'm not interested in that. So it is when you give like for implant place and you say, I need a GBR procedure and you need also soft tissue grafting. And then we can explain the timing. The timing can be something else, but the soft tissue approach, it always integrated part in the, in the treatment. Definitely. I just have. I'm just going back to um, a few minutes ago, um, the beginning of your your yeah. uh, session, uh, because Victor asks, does immediate loading of a single implant in the healed anterior maxillary area improve the aesthetic outcome compared to conventional loading? 
if I understood the question right, um, in my opinion, every time you do an immediate, okay, it you have a much um, easier and uh, let's say um, predictable way to control the tissues, okay? Because it is much easier to maintain something or give support with a provisional restoration than to reconstruct. Okay, so when you are in the situation that you need to reconstruct and guide the tissues, and, and th this is always a time consuming procedure um, with several sessions, chair side, and so on. So, wherever it is possible to have an immediate um, loading, I think it is, um, uh, it is the best. Preferable. From an aesthetic perspective, for sure. I mean, in the anterior zone, that is, uh, it becomes critical in the posterior, it's, it's much less. Thank you. I hope you, uh, that, that was the response you're looking for, Victor. Thank you so much for answering that, Mar Marilla. Please don't hesitate uh, once again in asking your questions during this live session in the chat on the right hand of the screen. So let's get back into it, Marella. <laughs> so as I mentioned, this is actually my preferred approach because uh, I mentioned it is very uh, technically easy, um, no stress, you know, um, damaging the palatal artery, uh, not getting into the deeper areas of the palate. You can take grafts that are long from the seventh back to the anterior. And it is, um, very, um, let's say, the morbidity for the patient is considerably less. Usually, it goes without uh, um, without problems from from them, like pain or um, postoperative sensitivity. So this is a very clear example of not doing a soft tissue, Haley. You know, for example, this implant placed with Nitsan. This is an old case. At that time, we had considerable amount of bone. Uh, we finalized the case, did the restoration, but there was no soft tissue approach, okay? And as you can see, there is this concavity, which we will always see. This is biology, it's not the, so the bone is there, everything is there, but what we are missing is actually what we like to see in natural dentition, the root okay. convexity, you know, the root prominence. This is what looks beautiful in natural teeth, right? This emergence of the teeth from the soft tissue. So. Just by a simple approach in this case was a tunnel, which actually I like. Uh, this is my favorite approach for cases that I need only volume. So only increase the thickness of tissue in a buccal palatal direction. Very simple, easy to use, small graft, uh, the same type as um, we mentioned before, deepitalized pre-gingival graft. And you see immediately the change in the curvature. So it is now very similar with the adjacent dentition. So in this case, also the restoration will have a contour that will be appropriate with not food entrapment and not uh, areas that will be over contour. So now really let's see something that will really emphasize exactly this problem that we might have, even if we build up the tissues and we have a wrongly designed crown which can ruin everything that we can uh, build up surgically. So for example, we saw this patient together with Nitsan. Um, we started to remove the crown, as you can see, it was a very deeply placed implant, very strange abutment. Um, soft tissues were um, you know, inflamed, but still there was no pathology of periimplantitis. You see the deepest of the implants, very thin tissues, very dark color of the tissues. So we understood immediately that we need to have here a soft tissue approach and then to have, of course, a better aesthetic restoration, a better crown. So the first phase we did, again, we come back a lot to the dental, to the, the traditional prosthetic uh, workflow. We created, Nitsan created an abutment that had a no finish line, you know, like in teeth, the vertical preparation. So we smoothened completely the abutment. He relined then a provisional shell, like you see here, with acrylic material. We marked the margins where we would like this crown to end, trim, create contours. This is just an initial provisional restoration. In order to create for me better soft tissues, to have now a soft tissue approach. Okay. So you see, after this is I think after one month, six weeks. Now I'm in a situation that I can have and create better thickness of tissue, mask the darkness uh, that we see here on the buccal aspect, 
Also maybe bring the tissue slightly more coronally. And here again, the question is, what is my goal? Because according to the goal, you're going to decide what is the most appropriate technique and what will be the best soft tissue graft that I can use. So whenever I can, I prefer to, to go for um, a less invasive, we can call it less invasive approach. Uh, I just want to create more thickness. So I mentioned before, I, I like this tunnel approach in which we actually create an envelope under which we are going to insert a uh, connective tissue graft. So in terms of the technique, I went for a tunnel approach. Of course, if I had to bring the tissues much more coronally, mm -hmm. I would go for a coronally advanced flap like the Zucchelli technique. In this case, I needed actually more volume in order to mask the grayish appearance and also to create this at least three millimeters of tissue for my future final crown. So we work with this type of microsurgical instrument, uh, releasing um, the, the flap both sides, not only on the buccal aspect of the implant, but also on the neighboring teeth. Why? Because we need also some slight coronal advancement of the tissues and we need also space to insert the graft. The approach for the soft tissue, um, as I mentioned, is the free gingival graft because it is again, very easy. Uh, very acceptable for the patient. This is the very thin. We, today we start to understand that we don't need to take very thick connective tissue grafts. 1.5, two millimeters is more than enough. And but the importance is to have a good quality mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day. When we look at our results long term, you need to have a very good stable result and a very good quality of the tissue. And then you see. Here after three months, this was the aim of the surgery, trying to bring the tissue slightly more coronal, but also increasing the volume. Now in this situation, we understand that it's a completely different story now to have a crown that will have proper contours. But here again, this was look at the time of insertion, you see the blanching of the tissues and the fact that the, as I mentioned, this is a mucosa now, it moves apical. And I like to mention this article and now also Stavros Pelicanos has published a recent one um, regarding the same areas, you know, what from the implant head till the soft tissues. And the idea is that you have one, you can call it a deep contour. In the article of Ernesto Lee, they call it a subcritical and critical contour. Stavros gave a different um, names for that. But the idea is that you define the area that belongs to the implant, and then the area that belongs to the soft tissue. And the deep contour is actually everything that comes from the implant head till the two millimeters close to the soft tissue. And these two millimeters that are close to the soft tissues are defined the superficial one. And why is this important? Because when we communicate, especially with the dental technician, and you ask the dental technician to do modifications, it is, was very different, difficult to explain which part of the crown, because the crown is one piece. Mm -hmm. From the implant head, it can have a transmucosa component or it can be directly to the uh, implant head, but you need to define certain areas and to understand the di dimension of these areas, how it will have an impact on the tissues. Because look, we understand that when we inserted this crown and we saw the blanching of the tissues, that this crown is putting too much pressure. Now, what will happen if we would not do any modification of this crown? At the end, this soft tissue will adapt to this new position. But basically, the soft tissue would have a considerably amount of apical migration compared to tooth number 11. Okay? So we have advantages, but the same that these advantages because this mucosa will adapt. So if you push too much the tissues, you're going to lose the tissues that you created with the previous surgery. So what we do clinically in this situation, we mark with a pencil, you see the black mark um, of where the soft tissue position margin is intraorally. And then we try to smoothen or to reduce or to decrease everything that is more apically to this line. And this is what you will see clinically. Immediately there is a space, there is a gap from the material that you remove. And this gap, the tissues will 
fill in. Those are tissues will come back more coronally. But then at the same time, we understood that in a mesiodistal which, uh, direction, which is the, in the deeper part from the implant head towards the soft tissue margin, the volume of this titanium abutment with the zirconia was too wide. So we prefer to go for the almost to, as the patient arrived to have only the titanium, to have the narrowest uh, stem possible, which comes from the implant head, so that we leave more space for the tissues. If you have more titanium or more zirconia, that means that you will push the tissues more and you're going to lose those tissues. So we understand now, and there, there is a change, by the way, today in the way that the prosthetic components of different companies are being built. We understand now that everything that comes from the implant head should have the narrowest design possible, almost like a tulip, that it comes from narrow and it starts to uh, become more wide towards the soft tissue margin in order to leave more space for the tissues. And this area, as Stavros has called it, the transitional zone, which relates for the, so the soft tissue, the deep and the transitional zone. Now look at the modification just by, this is a very simple example, just by changing the design of the crown in these areas, you will have a completely different position of the tissues. So you need to have the combination. So we obtain the goal in terms of the color and the position of the tissues and so on, but we need to have now the second part, which was actually the, uh, the design of the crown. And if just briefly how we started, if you pay attention also to the position of the papilla, mesially and distally for the, from, the, from the crown compared to the initial situation, we are in a much better situation. Mm -hmm. And all this just because of the, grafting. So this is really an important aspect. This is why today we will always have a soft tissue approach around our implants, especially when you plant the implants yourself. This was a case where the implant was um, a done deal, let's say, and we tried to improve the aesthetics and the aesthetics was both the white and the pink. But today when you plan your implants, regardless of the approach, it can be immediate, delayed, it doesn't matter you will always need to relate to the soft tissues because you want to be sure that you're not going to lose, but especially that you will be able to maintain the tissue, even slightly increase the volume over time. This is the, um, the aim. So if you don't have questions now, I would like to maybe just, if you have questions, then I can answer now or? There are, no, no, there are no questions. And as, as Orlando uh, correctly said, it's great and clear. Oh, <laughs> so, oh I'm happy to hear. It, uh, and Stefan says, great presentation, Marella. How important is it to polish the critical zone of the abutment or do you prefer it slightly roughened? No, no. So first of all, we everything that comes in contact with the tissues we know today that they should be very well polished and not glazed like this is the first um, first thing not roughened but they shouldn't be glazed they should be just very well polished and today in terms of the also the materials that we use uh, we know that zirconia is actually the let's say the best material that you could have for the soft tissues when we talk especially about this the transitional zone like the deep transitional or the cervical margins. Everything that is above the tissues, so everything that is above the soft tissue margin of that crown, it can be glazed. But everything that comes in contact with the tissues, um, uh, so everything on the deeper, deep contour of the crown, it should be very well polished, but not glazed, hand polished. Um you're talking about a lot of kind of restoration, especially with regards to previous uh, surgeries, you know, and the fact that client expectations have obviously evolved and changed and stuff. But what about um, implant placement? I, I don't know if you're going to come, maybe come on to that a bit later or, I mean, how do you manage that in in the whole, um, if, if, well, in the, <laughs> in the whole grand scheme of things, if you do have a case uh, and you have to have the added complication of bad implant placement, for example? So well, a very good question. You know, today we have, let's say, the approach and uh, was always to go for, first of all, we work guided um, because it really simplifies our life in many ways and you're much more predictable. And second is that we aim for screw retain restoration. So when you talk about implant placement, 
we like to call it prosthetically guided implant placement. Why? Because you plan ahead uh, the position of the final crown in order to have a screw retain restoration. We try to avoid really cemented restorations um, because of the, um, you know, the difficulty in removing the excess and so on. And the fact that we, the easy retrievability. So if you need to interfere, if you need to do something, it's very easy to unscrew it and uh, check and then connect it again. So in terms of the implant placement, this is our, let's say, um, um, philosophy in a way, to have it prosthetically guided so that will allow us at the end to have a screw return restoration. For example, and this lady, which is a, a very clear example, it's still it's some, it's like 2014. So, you know, it's very strange in implantology, concepts change every two years because uh, there are no prosthetic components. There are new, so everything is like, being updated because, for example, if you would ask me today, most probably would have treated the, this case, the same case, in a different way. Because this lady, for example, came um, with a central incisor, we removed the central incisor, we went for a delayed approach, and then she broke the lateral incisor. And then so now we had like a completely different uh, situation. You have one delayed placement and one immediate placement. And at that time, when we plan it, we had um, some exposure of the threads of the implant because of the position that we wanted to have prosthetically and so on. So I guess that today the approach would have been different. If we have time, we can maybe elaborate later on. But what I want to show you now regarding the, um, this concept of the soft tissue and how do we pr prosthetically guide them is that the approach was at the time, this is a time of uncovering, I did a small connective tissue graft, like I mentioned before. So at this time was the time of uncovering because at the time of implant placement, we did GBR, we did so many things. And, you know, sometimes you say too many miracles in one surgery is, uh, is you know, is a wishful thinking. So um, we, we staged them. So anyway, I knew I have to do an uncovering procedure. So I had to approach the soft tissue at that time. Simple tunnel, as I showed before. This was immediately after the intervention. And you see immediately the convexity of the tissues is just after the surgery. Then we had a provisional restoration, which was at this time completely under contour. And again, we come back to the same two areas. When you do any kind of soft tissue augmentation and you want to leave the tissues to heal, you will definitely not want to put any pressure in that area. So even this for the communication with the laboratory technician, we told them the superficial margin of that crown should be as flat as possible, one millimeter away from the soft tissue margin. So in this case, the superficial contour just gives you a tissue support, okay? So provisional or definitive, the design will change according to what is the aim. So in this case, we wanted to let the tissues heal. We were not into the conditioning phase of the soft tissues with the restoration. So we let everything to heal. The deep area was very narrow. This was given by the prosthetic components. And now comes this cervical contouring concept, like say a model-based design with implants. And it, what does it mean practically? How does it work? So, we have this situation clinically into our patient's mouth. This is two months after the healing with the provisional restoration. And this is exactly the way we would like the reach to look like, where the implant and the natural tooth is, we, we don't see any difference, okay? And this is the volume of tissues, Haley, that we talked uh, um, before, those at least three millimeters. Now, what happens is like that. You take an impression, it can be, digital or analog, doesn't matter which route you're taking. It depends on the technician you're collaborating with. And in this case, he has like a model, which is the exact situation, the replica of the situation from the patient's mouth, right? And then the technician has always an ideal situation. The ideal situation in our world is the wax up, is how would we like those teeth to look like in terms of the shape, the proportion, and especially when we treat teeth and implants. Okay? So you have here a combination, you see you have a crown, you have a missing tooth, an implant and a crown and then an implant and another crown. 
So the dental technician has these two situations. One is how the situation is in the patient's mouth when the tissues are not conditioned. The tissues are just healed after the uncovering and the soft tissue grafting. So usually you have extra tissues. This is the, let's say, the, the ideal and what you would want to have. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then they have an ideal one is what they would like to obtain. So now they, what they need to do is to transfer this ideal, let's say, call them lines or architecture or scalloping of the tissues. They need to transfer them from the ideal model, which is the wax up, to the actual working model, which is the patient's clinical situation. Okay, so what he does, he copies this, these red markings with a silicone key and he just brings it to the working model. Now what he has on the working model is what would be the ideal position of the soft tissues. And why we call it a model-based? We call it a model-based design because the idea behind it is exactly this. Let's try to reduce the sessions, the chair size session. You remember the, the guy with the central incisor, we put it in, we reduce, we take it out. You put it back, you reduce, you take it out. And this is this was the let's say the traditional way in which we were conditioning the tissues. So the idea behind it is okay. Why we make, can we make this process more um, predictable and straightforward? So now the dental technician has on his working model the ideal position that we would like to have. So what is he going to do? He's going to carve, remove all the excess of the in his case, gypsum, which is from the model, mm -hmm. which translated to the patient's mouth will be the soft tissue. So wherever he removes, that crown is going to feel pressure and put pressure on the tissues. But as I mentioned before, in implants, you're dealing with the mucosa. So now you know that at least the pressure that that crown will apply on the soft tissue is the desired one, okay? Because that crown is already being built with an ideal shape, because he worked on an ideal shape for that crown. So he is recontouring, reshaping, and you see immediately you have a completely different, let's say, aspect of everything that comes in this trans transitional zone from the implant head till the soft tissue margin. And we understand now that when he's going to build that crown and build the ceramics on top, teeth and implants, when you insert them in the mouth, it's going to guide the tissue to the desired position. Okay? So th this is the, the reasoning behind it, trying to make it in a much more predictable way already in the lab. And by the way, you can have the same approach for provisional or for definitive. Okay, So let's say that you want not to go straight for a definitive restoration, you can go for a provisional one, have the same process, have, let the patient go with the provisional restoration and then later on just copy that into the definitive. So the concept works the same. We have a question from Guillermo uh, Seracedo. He says, thank you for your presentation. When you have a conventional implant placement and you need to perform a soft tissue graft and bone graft, do you prefer a simultaneous approach or staged? Um, that depends on actually the prosthetic approach, and I will explain. If I have to do um, implant placement with a bone graft, and uh, this is going to be submerged, like it's going to be a two-stage, and I will need to uncover the implant later on, I prefer to do the soft tissue approach with the uncovering of the implant. If for whatever reason it is possible uh, to connect a provisional, not lo completely loaded, but have a provisional restoration on top of that implant, I would prefer to have uh, a combined approach. And um, like Professor Zucchelli is describing this a lot with the mucogingival type of flap uh, being released, adding bone, membrane, and then a small connective tissue graft attached to the flap and then reposition this buckley to the implant. But again, if I will, uh, the approach would be staged, hmm. like this implant will be submerged, I prefer to do the soft tissue um, later on. And Maria Margariti says, what graft do you prefer when you need stable gingiva and 
height and horizontal volume. Okay, so I will. I have the tendency to use the same approach to have a free gingival graft. And then if you need more volume, what is very nice to do, you can take a longer one and then you can connect them two together. Meaning that if you take a free, a free gingival graft and you have a thickness of two, 1.5, two millimeters, if you attach one to the other, you know, like you do like a sandwich, <laughs> okay? Then you get the double thickness with the same high quality of connective tissue. So if I need more thickness, if I need, if, let's say if I do a procedure like the platform procedure of Professor Zucchelli, and then I need more volume also buccally and coronally, either I use, I, either I connect them and I stabilize them connected, or I use multiple also on the buckle or also on the crest. It depends on the, um, on the procedure itself. But usually if I need more thickness, then I connect two grafts to have more, more volume because then you multiply it and you have the same high quality. Thank you for your response and thank you for your question, Maria. Um, now, as I said, don't hesitate in asking any questions to this evening's guest, Mirella, uh, who is very happy to answer any queries you may have uh, on this evening's Just Ask. So let's dive back in, <laughs> where are we? Okay, so this was uh, the final result of this lady. And it's very interesting. This is always what we are seeing with this type of graft, this slight migration, you know, slight creeping of the soft tissues uh, in time and slight increase of thickness. Because in a way they behave very similar with the tuberosity graft. So this is, uh, this is another, um, let's say, reason why we like to perform this type of procedure because you take them very thin and you get very good response when you look at the results of uh, the long term. And this was the, you know, the integration, of course, of the implants, but also you see they maintain a very nice volume when we look also from um, an occlusal aspect and the smile of the patient. So overall, a good result. But, you know, I mentioned to you, Haley, that if we had to treat this patient today, Believe me, would they have a completely different approach? And the reason is that today we have prosthetic components, and I'm sure that um, you heard of this a lot. The Stavros talked a lot about this, this one abutment, one time, transmucosal um, uh, prosthetic components, and because this became today, let's say, like the, um, the goal. Whenever we can, we prefer to work with transmucosal components, either multi-unit or different type of, uh, depending on the companies, that allow us practically to connect at the time of the implant this type of prosthetic component and then play with the restoration at the tissue level. Okay. So also in the, the case of the lady, definitely for many reasons, the approach could have been completely different. Um, for example, in this case, um, this guy, went for a full mouth rehabilitation because we see also occlusal problem, but I will concentrate on the area of the central, um, which we can see we had a, a big deficiency in terms of the soft tissue, but mainly on the heart tissues. But still today, with the help of this type of transmucosal components, when we plan uh, together with Nitsan, the positioning of the implant, as you can see for a screw and restoration, we already included in the planning this transmucosal component. So it's, it, it really allows us to, let's say, um, by prosthetic means, it helps us to ease up the surgical stages. Why? Because now we know we can place the implant more deep okay, and still have a component that we connect at the time of implant placement and then the entire platform, the entire interface, it moves for the tissue level. So we planned it, as, as you can see here, for a screw tank crown. And we had, I had to augment the area after the implant was inserted. You see the, the defect um, surrounding with membranes and bones. And we planned it to be submerged. And you see at that time, we connected already a transmucosal component. This was a, um, before the connect appear on the market. And uh, I, I just attached a, a long healing screw because I wanted to have access to the implant. So today, the approach would be to connect exactly at the time of implant placement, this type of transmucosal component, and then have what we like to call a one-time abutment. 
Then regarding the question, I think Maria asked or the person before, you saw if I have to do a bone augmentation together with the implant, but this procedure will be staged, I will do the soft tissue procedure uh, the uncovering. It just works better in my hands. You know, I'm I'm more feeling more comfortable of not adding so much healing uh, processes at one time. So at this stage, when we uh, uncovered, I added a very thin, you see very small, very thin connective tissue graft, and then we connect this type of transmucosa components. And the idea behind it is the moment you have a screw on any kind of prosthetic component, you have not a hermetic seal. This is known. Wherever there is a screw, there will be always a channel for, let's say, bacteria and so on to infiltrate. The other thing is that you prefer not to have repeated insertion and disinsertion of these prosthetic components. So the idea came to use, and this you heard from Stavros a lot, the idea one time abatments, either on multi units, either on this type of um, um, connect, if you'd like to call it, which is a completely different concept. You see, very narrow. You remember I mentioned at the beginning that all the design of the newly prosthetic components from majority of the companies start to be narrow from the base and then they enlarge towards the soft tissue surface. So basically you build, you bring the interface, the prosthetic interface away from the bone. And then from there, you can connect, disconnect, you can play with restoration. It will never have an impact on the stability of the bone surrounding that implant. Okay, so it helps you surgically to position the implant where you have sufficient amount of bone. So you can even insert the implants more um, uh, infracrestally because you have the possibility to have this type of one piece, which is a monoblock. It doesn't have a screw. It becomes part of the implant. You torque it down, it becomes part of the implant. You can use it for single or for multiple. And basically it allows you to shift this interface to the tissue level, okay? Mm -hmm. So this part is actually the deep contour. Everything from the implant head to the soft tissue, it becomes already the prosthetic component. And then you have um, the restoration that is on the soft tissue. So this is how it actually works. This is a small animation. So if this is the deficiency side and you have the ideal wax up, which is the ideal, let's say, shape you would like to have. Now you have the implant that is, let's say, healed. We attach these transmucosa components, which it doesn't matter if they are multi-units, you know, whatever the company offers, the majority of them have them already. And then you mark, the technician is marking these lines, like I showed before, copying these lines, which is the ideal contour, and they, it brings it to the working model, okay? So the, now in this situation, as I mentioned, always he will have extra tissues. If we did soft tissue procedure or soft tissue augmentation, the aim is to have extra tissues above the implant. So by copying this line, now he knows how much he needs to remove in order to create this nice cervical design. And this will always relate to the superficial part of the crown because the deep part of the crown, which is from the implant head, will always be narrow. Narrow and slim to let the tissues have more volume. And then the only part that we will, let's say, contour or relate to, as you can see here, you see the immediately the tissues adapt to the pressure because this pressure is generated by the new contour of, of that crown. So this is the idea behind it. And you can see here, this is the important thing is that your prosthetic platform now, in this prosthetic interface is being shifted to the tissue level. And here we don't have any more problems if we need to insert, disconnect, make modification chair side, you don't interfere with the most sensitive part, which is actually the, um, the implant head with the, um, the surrounding heart tissues of the implant. So this allows you in a way to also to have an approach chair side, if by any way you prefer that, to make, to trim, to adjust, insert, reinsert. 
without damaging anything regarding the Oster integration of that implant. So what if say the patient had had multiple um, grafts? I mean, could that? How would that complicate? And what impact would that have uh, on any kind of restoration um, surgery? Because you you know you you mentioned the fact that you know the fact that um, multiple um, how would I say uh, incessant kind of taking out any implant and putting it back is obviously having an impact on the result. But what if? No as well there was a the patient not the implant the crown you mean like inserting and disinserting the crown on the implant yeah because the, the idea is that every time you disconnect and reconnect the crown on an implant if this is this is the question yeah or but so what if the soft tissue is multiple um uh, grafts would that how what what, what impact would that would have on it or are you pre assuming that the soft tissue is just a result of or it, how, what do you what soft tissue are you basing this on no, so first of all, you you always have a soft tissue approach. So you right. will have a soft tissue augmentation. Mm -hmm. Now, it depends on the case of which type of uh, technique you will use. But let's say that now you already have your soft tissues, you have everything inserted. Your question is regarding the crown or regarding yeah, the your... crown. Okay, so at th this time, it depends on how um, this crown, it, what is connected. If you have a crown that is... Um, directly to the implant head. So without any transmucosal component, mm -hmm. okay? Then the more you is remove and reattach and dis the, um, disconnect and reconnect the crown, you are uh, creating a slight inf inflammation. You are interfering with the, let's say the biology that surrounds that implant, okay? And the most sensitive area is exactly the, the marginal bone mm -hmm. and the soft tissue attachment. Mm -hmm. The moment that you use, and this is why this is why the first one-time abutment concept was introduced, to try to have at the time of the surgery already a definitive abutment, and in many situations then the crown had to be cemented, already uh, built in. Today the shift was created by the understanding that we can work with transmucosal components, and those transmucosal components you can choose them in terms of height according to your clinical indication. And then you shift everything to a level like you see, I don't know if you see my screen, yeah. that you have two or three millimeters above this transmucosa component, which now there is a seal. The seal is around the implant and the seal is around the base of this transmucosa component. So you are not anymore interfering with the adhesion, uh, the adhesion of this tissue or with, um, uh, let's say the seal of this tissue surrounding those implants. And this seal um, is very, very fragile, much more fragile than is on a natural dentition. And, and this is the idea behind it. Now, at this stage, you can disconnect, reconnect, play, change, something happen. You will, you will not have any problem. Why? Because your platform now, it is on the soft tissue level, above the most critical area, let's say, which is the the um, surrounding the head of the implant. So this is the rationale today of, of going for um, this type of one-time abutment, but this one-time abutment is actually described by this transmucosa component. Um, what about the TRI abutmentless cementless implant? That's I what, don't um, uh, have our, what, what yes. I don't have any what do you how did you call it? TR? So our um Al Sayed wants to know what about the TRI implant abutmentless cementless implant? You mean like one piece implant? If you can ask if he can reply, if he talks about one piece type of implants. Um, Arwa, if you are, well, I'm sure you are watching. Uh, do you mean the one piece implant? Uh, well, let's wait for her reply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, because you know, one piece implant, or let's say this is the, it would be like ideal. And in a way, this is what you create with this type of transmucosal components, because the moment you connect them to the implant, it becomes like a one piece implant with a soft tissue part that you control the height and the position of that. And um, this, theoretically, this should be ideal, but the problem is the versatility. So here you have, let's say, a, an area to play with because you can decide the height and it doesn't influence you from a surgical perspective how deep you place the implant. 
So you control the surgical part as well as the prosthetic part. And of course, always the best solution is to try to avoid um, cemented restoration, especially when the implants are um, uh, placed deep. So I don't know I, uh, if this was the question that he referred. I don't have uh, experience um, with this type. Um, okay. So that so was, um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's move, let's uh, move on to your next slide. So at the end, just uh, um, actually, again, we work with Stefano. So this was the analog way, if we can call it like that. And uh, we take a traditional impression and uh, we did also some veneers for the same patient, follow all the uh, traditional steps. Um, and then, as you can see, we this is um, just briefly the approach that we would like to have in terms of the final restoration. So we have a T-base, we have a zirconia core on top, and then we have this type of veneer that we, we bond. So this is what we call the hybrid crown. And what you see here um, is also one of the things that um, I mentioned that in that case of the lady, we would, would have done different today because today you can correct prosthetically the angulation, okay, of the, um, uh, so let's say if you place the implant and theoretically you should have a cemented restoration, today using this type of biaxial screws, up to 25 degrees, you can correct the angulation and still have a screw return restoration. So you see many things are changing in the prosthetic field and have an influence on the, on the surgical aspect, because in that case, we would have a completely different approach. We could correct this prosthetically. We wouldn't need to have it threads of the implant exposed and so on. Overall, prosthetically, this is the preferred option for us, the hybrid crown. And then you see here very clearly what are the contours. So the deep zone, it's the one from the implant head to the soft tissue margin, which is being given by this transmucosa component. And the superficial one is the one that will have an impact on the uh, soft tissue positions, as I mentioned before. And this was the, um, the final result of, of this patient. So at the end of the day, you know, you need to um, graft for sure and have um, um, the understanding of how to and when to condition the tissues with your um, restoration. I think this is the, um, when you start from the, um, from the situation that your implant is correctly positioned from a two-dimensional uh, aspect. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Morella. I think that's um, all we will have time for this evening. It's been a fascinating uh, session with you. Um, and thank you everyone, of course, for sending in your questions, for telling us where you were tuning in uh, from this evening, this morning or this afternoon, from wherever you are tuned in from around the world. Thank you once again, uh, Morella, for your time and uh, for taking us through um, the, today's session. So, uh, as you do know, the EAO Annual uh, Congress will be joint meeting with the German Association, the GI. There is still time to register and be a part of this unique event. Uh, you still benefit from preferential rate until September the 22nd. So don't hesitate and join us from September the 28th to the 30th in Berlin, Germany. All of the info is in the description box. Thank you once again for your time. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for tuning in with us this evening. This is on replay, of course, on the EAO YouTube channel. So you can and it will be available to rewatch on replay. So thank you very much. Have, as I said, have a nice evening, morning or afternoon from wherever you are in the world. And once again, thank you very much, Morella. Thank you very much thank and you. goodbye.